thank you. I've had a fun couple of days, so really happy to be here. Um, apparently, I didn't get my talk ready. Um, so I'll tell you about the H0 puzzle, which is uh, work done with Harry Desmond and Jeremy Sachstein. I couldn't resist having a second part of the talk, uh, which is uh, work done by Te Shen, Sushmita Adhikari, and others. Te and Sushmita are on the postdoc job market, hence in blue. The resolution of the H0 puzzle I'll talk about has to do with Cepheid variables. So these are giant stars that cross the instability strip and have these order unity oscillations. So they're going to be the key to the story. But I'll get to them in a little while. That's why I thought I'd throw up a teaser. So I'll give you a status update on where cosmology is. Many of you are quite familiar with it, but I'll tell you what I know. And then describe this resolution. And then I'll describe some small scale tests of the dark energy CDM model, because we think some of the signatures will show up more prominently in small scales. So I'll show you stuff we are doing with galaxy clusters and splashback, since I know some of you work on hydrosems and related topics. So as you may have heard, the universe today seems to be expanding faster than it has any right to, at least if you buy CMB, general relativity, cold dark matter, and dark energy. Um, so mo most cosmologists like all of these things. So this is a real puzzle that H0 measured today is larger than you'd expect from CMB measurements. It also appears to have, uh, so far only at the two, three sigma level, smaller fluctuations. So sigma eight is lower um, than you'd expect from the CMB. So this is a familiar plot to many of you, H0 omega matter. This is a local measurement of H0, uh, which is just H0. Um, and these contours show different versions of CMB um, estimates of, uh, of H0. So this was, um, uh, this was a four sigma discrepancy in 2018. It seems to be progressing at a healthy clip because this summer there were slides at various conferences that went up to six sigma. Okay, so you know there's much to be argued about, um, but the facts that to me are salient are that there's two independent ways to get an early universe estimate of H naught. One is purely from the CMB; the other does not involve the CMB at all. Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and then local measurements that use the sound horizon from the early universe. So two independent channels give you that estimate based on the, the sound horizon. And late time measurements, um, the two probably most noteworthy are the shoes measurement that use Cepheids and supernovae and the holy cow that uses strong lensing. These are other things which r r currently have much bigger error bars, so we don't need to worry about them. This one, maybe we do need to worry about. This is tip of the red giant branch plus supernovae. So change Cepheids to tip of the red giant branch, change Reese et al. to Friedman et al. I'm not going to speculate on any sociological matters, but you, you get a different age knot. Uh, this is very recent, and there have been some, you know, rebuttals and stuff. So it'll be interesting to watch. This is very mature, which is not to say it may not have any flaws, but it's definitely the most scrutinized of all these measurements. The strong lensing one, if you'd like to discuss it, I'm happy to chat later. There's been um, worries about the robustness of the mass models. And a week or so ago, Chris Kochanek put out a very clear, simple paper about this issue. Uh, and his claim is that there's a systematic uncertainty that's going to be exceedingly hard to reduce. And it's about this big. I don't know. 
So, <clears throat> so he claims that because of this mass sheet degeneracy type issue, um, you need some really amazing futuristic data set to, uh, to reduce that uncertainty. But this is the current bottom line. It's definitely more than four sigma now. Um, so it's a possible crisis of the standard model of cosmology. So if you look for resolutions, if you say that it's not some um, nasty systematic in the data, but it's new physics, then this is a good place to start. This is the universe today, mostly dark energy, then dark matter, then baryons. Any early universe measurements are looking at a very different color scheme. There's no blue. For any standard dark energy model, it's negligible uh, at last scattering. And it's mostly dark matter, but with a respectable showing by photons and neutrinos. And all of that is relevant when you look at different proposals to resolve this tension. Just to show the most beautiful measurements in cosmology. <laughs> the Planck, T, 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 E, 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 and lensing power spectra. So it's these that give um, the CMB H naught using, to a large extent, the locations and relative heights of these peaks. And that's also relevant because uh, this is how uh, the CMB gets the angular, so the, so the CMB measures this, the location of the first peak, the, the angular size of the sound horizon. So that's given by the ratio of two numbers. One is a calculation of the sound horizon in centimeters or megaparsecs, real physical units, that uses the energy contents of the universe from t equals zero to 400,000 years. You divide that physical size by the angular diameter distance to the CMB. And that distance, as you know, the distance is an integral of dz over h of z with uh, some other factor. So it goes inversely with h of z that you integrate from z of 0 to loss scattering. So this depends on h naught and your model for the late universe. And so you take this measurement, this calculation, these ingredients, and fit for H naught. So, <clears throat> so you have an early universe and a late universe piece. The problem is that any resolution that tries to change the estimated H naught, you can tweak this and this and this and that, but you have not just the sound horizon, but the damping scale and the matter radiation equality scale that are estimated from the same data. And so when you add some mix, like add a new relativistic species or a new phase of dark energy, you're going to mess with uh, possibly all of these numbers. And you'll degrade the fit to the CMB data. So let's look at a few of these. Uh, We've had dark energy now. The universe is approaching the space spacetime. We probably had it to get inflation. Why not have it one more time? Okay. So this requires a period, an episode of dark energy domination just before recombination that would change the sound horizon and therefore the inferred H naught could go up. You could have new species or interactions in the early universe, um, a relativistic species, dark matter decay. You could change the theory of gravity. Again, these late universe options, the late universe options would keep the CMB H naught, but would uh, change, uh, sorry, it would change the, ma the connection of CMB to late universe H naught by changing the late time expansion history. And those are disfavored because the supernovae and BAO measure the expansion rate of the universe from redshift zero, basically, out to redshift beyond z of one. So it's very hard to mess with those fairly tight constraints on the expansion rate. 
So you would need to do something very local, and the possibility of a local void is also tightly constrained by uh, the supernovae data. So people have been, at, you know, to the extent that theorists speak with their feet, most of the papers are about modifications to early universe physics. So I'll show you an example that's uh, of a different sort, um, and then you can s see what you feel about this whole game. So to give you some examples of why this is difficult, there's the idea of dark radiation, some near relativistic species, um, which is, first of all, constrained by the CMB data, the other angular scales measured. But it also versions another tension that I'll talk about. So this shows H0 and effective, and the color bar shows sigma 8, the amplitude of mass fluctuations. So if you want the CMB inferred H0 to go towards Reese at all, you move towards the red points, and they are red for a reason, because that's the danger zone for sigma 8, because this value of sigma 8 becomes, instead of 2 sigma, it gets into 3, 4 sigma tension with local measurements. So you resolve one puzzle and make another one worse. Uh, there's a, a relatively recent proposal of some strong interactions in the neutrino sector that claims that they help both the tensions, but it's a very complicated model. Um, so just giving you a flavor for the kinds of exercises people are doing. So you can ask, um, uh, whether this model solves H0, so by, according to these authors, not quite. It makes the sigma A tension worse. Doesn't have a tooth fairy. Model building is easy. Localized dark energy injection does this, makes this worse. But you have to explain why, at, when the universe was 100,000 years, there was a sudden episode of dark energy domination, which then disappears. Model building hard, interacting neutrinos, which is their model, so it looks better on this table. But this is the way people are starting to evaluate the models. And this idea of looking at both these tensions is quite important and quite new in the theory community. Uh, so quantitatively, this is a little uh, uh, older paper. This is Reese et al. 2018. Um, oh, no, oh, sorry. The, anyway, I think, oh, maybe this is the new paper. So they point out that um, this is the late universe H0, this is the early universe H0, and somehow all these models, when they look at the other constraints, mainly from CMB, they can get to two sigma, maybe three sigma. Um, but um, it's not easy. So we talked about the H0 tension. Reveri and Hu looked at other kinds of tensions between cosmology data sets, uh, between, um, and for particular parameters. So they point out the H0 tension. They look at many different measures of significance. And this is one of them, where I think this side is you know, too consistent, and this side is tension. So this would be roughly three sigma type tension. So the H0 tension has grown since they published their paper. This is the next tension that they talk about. Depending on the metric, it's two or three sigma. So this is still floating around here. And I'll talk about this next. And then there's the A lens tension, which with some data sets is formally significant. But the CMB community, as we discussed at lunch today, doesn't take it very seriously as an indicator of new physics. So given all these tensions, I'm of course talking about the GR plus lambda CDM model. Uh, and you know, impeachment is kind of a funny word that, uh, you know, technically speaking, Trump is very likely to be impeached on a one month time scale, but that just means the first chamber votes to impeach him. And then whether he actually loses his presidency is quite unlikely and will play out on a many-month time scale. So if you swap maybe months for years, 
the standard model of cosmology is in a similar situation where theorists are definitely <laughs> working on alternatives. So that first stage of getting theorists to change what they're doing, we've reached. But theorists are cheap, so it's not very serious yet. Um, I'll stop with that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's an understatement. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Sigma 8, which is probed by lensing and 3D galaxy surveys. Both tell us about um, the amplitude of mass fluctuations. I won't have time to give you much of an introduction, but I'll just I'll give you a few bottom lines of where things stand. So this is an old plot that I like because Wayne has good taste in color schemes. So I'm showing it even though it's quite outdated. Uh, so this is H0, local CMB. This is sigma 8, which is which? Uh, CMB, local. Um, and uh, you know a sobering commentary on the progress in sigma 8 is that this tension has grown higher. With more data, this tension has still remained about the same. And the whole thing has shifted a little. So that gives you some idea about how robust it is. Uh, so this is the survey uh, I'm working on, the dark energy survey. Uh, so I'll show you results from our year one analysis, which was 30 million galaxies over 1,200 square degrees. Uh, we are in a fairly advanced stage of an analysis that's about three times bigger. And we hope to publish our collection of at least a dozen papers early next year. So this is the mass map um, from our year one uh, release. And uh, oh, sorry, yeah, I wanted to mention our peers. The kids survey is complete. Subaru HSC is in progress. And so their analysis is also proceeding in parallel with ours. Uh, and of course, the DESI Redshift Space Survey has just begun. It got first like last month. And so its results are a couple of years away. This is, uh, you know, just as the CMB publishes one power spectrum because they see one uh, redshift slice of the sky. We, we have split our galaxies into four redshift slices, so we get all the autocorrelations of the lensing shear, as well as cross-correlations. And here the scale is multiplied by theta, so correlations die roughly like 1 over theta, but this lets you get a closer look at them. And the only point I want to make is, you know, lambda CDM is a pretty good fit to our data. And, uh, Error bars, if you look at the best cases around here, are still at, you know, per bin, they're more than 10%. But collectively, we get a better than 5% constraint on the amplitude. So at first brush, CMB, redshift space distortions, even Lyman alpha, and lensing all line up with the lambda CDM model. You've probably seen some version of this plot before, but this has five orders of magnitude on the y-axis. So if you look a little more closely, then you get plots like this, which is from um, comparing DES and Planck. And in S8, it's some combination of sigma eight and omega matter that we measure well, um, and omega matter. So depending on whether you work in two-dimensional parameter space or one-dimensional parameter space or the full six-dimensional parameter space or the 50-dimensional parameter space of nuisance parameters and cosmology parameters, you can get different answers to is there a tension or not. Being conservative people, we concluded this is not a tension in our year one release. Uh, this is showing other lensing measurements, some of which show three sigma tensions, um, but all of them show Planck higher, lensing lower. 
feel free to stop me if you have any questions or I'm going too fast. Uh, this is from a recent paper that combined the kids survey with BOSS, the reactor space um, galaxy power spectrum, and we can look at just this plot that shows when you combine these and compare to Planck, you get something closer to a three sigma tension. Do you have one question? This is probably like very sort of starting to get a little tangential, so it's better for you to know. But sort of see this often with like you know historical stuff in science where people are trying to make measurements and they get some number and then the next person gets a number that's a little bit different, but they're like kind of nervous, so they make it just like a little bit. They got their error bars, and then like a couple years later, it's like a little bit different, and until like everyone converges to something that's just wildly different from the original measurement. To what extent? Could similar, more like people things be happening for all of these discrepancies? I don't know about the rest of the cosmology community. You know, they're obviously susceptible to all kinds of biases. But we <laughs> have a rigorous blinding protocol. So we don't see our results until all the papers are written. And only these plots remain to be made. Um, and that unveiling is public, at least to the 200 members of the collaboration, you know, one person. <laughs> so it is really a strict blinding protocol. And we have a paper now on the blinding protocol and how, you know. So I don't think we, as, uh, we have a confirmation bias. Uh, another team that has a good blinding protocol is the Holy Cow Strong Lensing Collaboration. So there may be other issues as we are uh, seeing, but the, I don't think they were su subject to confirming the supernovae H naught. But it's a fair question to ask. At least in the lensing community, I know the kids team and the Subaru team also follow blinding. So I'm pretty confident that the three lensing teams are, um, they may have issues, but confirmation bias is not one of them in my opinion. The same is true No. And I have always argued against uh, this because you have real astrophysics in front of you. On the other hand, for ACT, we are blinding, have blinded, and we will soon unblind because we're about at that stage. And the reason for that is because the H naught problem is of such interest to the community, we thought, well, I, I argued against it, but I don't prevail. Uh, with the microwave background, you have to really understand everything about the foregrounds, etc. And so to have blinded uh, part of it uh, is not necessarily, but you have the same issues. You have to deal with all I mean, it's issues. a royal pain to blind, I'll tell you that. I mean, and there's a real price in terms of how much time it takes to complete the work. Yeah. I could tell you exactly why, but it's for the kind of reasons that you're talking about, that you have to think through what all you want to learn from all the tests for systematics, and which of them will get screwed up if you've blinded the signal. And so how you blind to preserve the power of those tests while retaining the blinding on the cosmology is a lot of um, extra effort. So. Um, so there's this comment that the three lensing surveys have not yet been combined in any careful way. And similarly, lensing and red space distortions have not been combined aside from this one paper. So that's something that, uh, that could be done. You know, most of this data is public. If any of you are motivated, you could do it. Uh, we are not yet doing it because all three lensing surveys are still sitting on twice as much data or five times as much data in our case. So we're just proceeding with the data analysis. And this is showing one possible scenario. This is Planck S8. I guess this must be a dark energy uh, with W free. Um, this is KIDS S8. This is DES S8. So in what we're going to publish, we'll have narrower con contours. The question is, will they sit here or here or here? <laughs> so this is the more provocative possibility. Um, so, of course, we are eager to find out. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a proposal that we published this summer 
for a local resolution of H0. So these are the 20 galaxies that Reese et al. use to measure the local H0. So each of these had a, has had a supernova go off. And the red dots show these Cepheid variables, these pulsating stars that have been measured quite carefully in all these galaxies. So they measure the period luminosity relation of each of these stars. And they, so they measure the period. They get the luminosity from that relation. They compare it to the measured flux that gives them a distance. And distance gives you H0. So we looked at the Cepheids more closely. Most astronomers who look at Cepheids are looking at measurement or inference issues like what's the metallicity where the Cepheid's sitting and how does it compare to local Cepheid, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we were looking at something completely different. So uh, an intro to Cepheids, there are these pulsating giant stars and the period, it's just like a ball of gas that's pulsating. Um, is something that makes it unstable, the ionization of helium, but that doesn't matter. For us, it's just a, a ball of gas. Period is related to 1 over root g rho. Rho is estimated very well. So we were looking at the possibility that there's scalar tensor gravity or some other kind of scalar field that enhances gravity preferentially in Cepheids. I'll motivate that in a second. But the summary is that if you enhance G by 10%, you'll change P by 5%. And if you change P, you'll underestimate the distance, and so you'll overestimate H0. <laughs> okay. So the sign is easy to get right, because when in scalar tensor theories, you generically produce an attractive force, so you do enhance G. What is much harder to get right is um, the way that it would preferentially affect Cepheids to the right amount. So just to tell you that Cepheids are very well understood systems. These are the absolute magnitudes in three bands, radial velocity, even the radius. And these are the predictions of a numerical model with just one or two free parameters related to the opacity. You know, they fit the data beautifully. These are not some mysterious nonlinear objects. Uh, stellar evolution knows exactly what's going on. But, but the uh, uh, thing that I didn't know at, that uh, Mary Medora said at the Chicago conference is that for some of these, the Cepheids have gone through the instability strip 11 times, whereas most are not very many times, which, I mean, that's not, is that reflected in this uh, figure? I mean, this is for what is delta Cepheid. This is for one of the best known Cepheids ah, yeah, okay. for which this prediction is for, I don't know which crossing, second or third yeah, crossing yeah, on the, yeah. of the instability strip. Of course, for much more distant Cepheids, you're right. There are uncertainties to do with metallicity and which crossing of the instability strip you're on. Yes. But is that, I mean, you don't have a, there, there is a lot of theory, but not enough theory to give you the detailed relationship. So it's still empirical, I think. Uh, How many times it's crossed the strip? Sorry? I don't, I, don't, I don't really see how you can, but it was just uh, Barry's uh, comment when he was uh, saying, forget about Cepheids in spite of the fact that I spent most of my career on it. And, and then went over to the tip of the red giant branch. And part of it was uh, because the Cepheids may not be homogeneous as a population. I don't believe this N crossing of the instability strip is a serious issue. Maybe not. Uh, the metallicity is because you, know, you need to invoke something in which these Cepheids differ from the calibration sample. And the, you, know, you can see that they're located in some particular parts of galaxies. Um, and the other issue is that these are late type galaxies, whereas the, whereas the galaxies used to get H0, sorry, this is the calibration sample, are, have a, a, a greater mix of early and late type. So yeah, 
but I'm no expert on Cepheids. Another question. Um, another way to test this hypothesis is look at that, uh, say, I'm sorry, I, can, I, I didn't hear that. So I'm saying another way to test uh, the stellar models is, is to look at the surfaces in binaries and measure the mass, yeah, the independent measure, measurement of the mass. And you know, if any, if any kind of, of uh, tests have been done? There's one spectacular case in the LMC. Everything hangs together at like the 3 or 4% level. The stellar revolution mass and dynamical mass are bang on. And you could worry about confirmation bias, but yeah. Uh, there are no red flags that I'm aware of. Um, although, oh, the, the other issue is deblending in these crowded fields. So, uh, just to tell you how bright these guys are, this is a single Cepheid in M31, and you can see it in these HST data. Okay, so you don't have to do any fancy statistics to get the period luminosity relation. This one's particularly appealing because it told us that the universe has galaxies. So in 1923, Hubble measured, found, or maybe it was a known Cepheid, I don't remember, but he measured the, peri the period of the Cepheid and was like, oh, this is not in our galaxy. So the, I, I guess this was the first extragalactic Cepheid. And so that settled this debate, you know, in a, this is, of course, a simplified version uh, of whether these galaxies are little blobs in the Milky Way or they're external galaxies. So they've been useful in cosmology more than once. So uh, Jeremy Sachstein took this beautiful stellar evolution code, MESA, and put in screened modified gravity uh, and generated these post-main sequence evolution curves. And this is the point about, so this is when the star goes off the main sequence. This is when it pulsates within this instability strip. And so you can see that you have to worry about which crossing you're on in order to use the right period luminosity relation. So we know how to do these calculations. The motivation I'm giving you now that any time you change the dark energy or modified gravity, you invoke new degrees of freedom. And you know higher dimensions show up as new scalar fields. So it's fairly generic. Um, of course, you do require it to be light, and you do require it to have a certain kind of screening, which is to say that this does not affect solar system tests of gravity, but can affect things either outside the Milky Way or other types of stars. So this is a a field that theorists have worked on quite a lot in the last decade or so uh, that I won't go into. The models have become a little less appealing since the discovery of this optical counterpart to the LIGO event that killed some of these models. But it's still an active area of theoretical work. So our point of view was, so anyway, this is the kind of ongoing work. So our point of view was just to notice that Cepheids and supernovae are extremely different objects in terms of compactness, density, surface potential. So if there is some scalar tensor gravity, some scalar field, there's the possibility that in some galaxies, some Cepheids will be unscreened. They'll feel this fifth force, and they'll pulsate faster. And that's all we require. Not that out of these 20 galaxies, some tens of percent of Cepheids are unscreened. To get Cepheids to be unscreened and the sun and supernovae to be screened, you have to set a screening threshold that is fine-tuned. And the strength of this modification, uh, you know, generally theories have coefficients of order unity. The theories that we've seen, f of r, dgp, the coefficient is one third, so a 30% modification when you're fully unscreened. And so getting that strength of, mo of modification to work out, uh, to be motivated, is pretty natural. OK? So that's the full disclaimer about our model. The theories are weakly motivated, and they have a fine tuning. <laughs> You can decide whether that's any worse than early dark energy or strongly interacting neutrinos. 
Uh, this is one example of, uh, you know, the screening can be set by various criteria. One of them is the local dark matter density. This is the Milky Way. This is our estimate of the local dark matter density of all those Cepheids. And you can see this is all we require, that some significant fraction of them are unscreened. That is, they live in low density regions. And then this is the last plot on this uh, stuff. So depending on, you know, we tried to be model agnostic to the extent possible, so we use different screening uh, proxies. Uh, and so we can shift the local H naught by two sigma. A little more in one case. This is a completely different screening scenario where we get something similar. Did you make use of the, uh, I like that uh, plot with all the red points on it which showed the distribution. Um, the way well, at least I think the screening works is that you more or less hit a critical density and then everything's screened. Yes. So this would be in the outskirts. And so um, I don't know if anybody's tried to do a split in terms of location. We calculate uh, uh, th this for each, each Cepheid. You know, yeah. So the LMC is in fact. Sorry? That depends. If it's a local density screening, then it, it could be unscreened. If it's what's called F of R gravity, then it's likely screened by the Milky Way. So yeah, that's a relevant question. So you could look into the details of the calibration ladder. Is it through NGC 4258? Is it through LMC? Is it through Milky Way? Um, there are also other types of stars like Myris and so on. Yes. That would be affected differently. Sorry? They're giants, right? So yes. And TR, interestingly, TRGBs, because they're driven by core physics, are going to be much closer to supernovae. So we would expect the TRGBs to give us a different answer. Yeah. But we didn't go too far. It's just somewhat amusing to consider that you could have a systematic in the local H naught that's actually due to new physics because the Cepheid calibration is off as a complete alternative to the early universe resolutions. My personal view is, so this is wide open, so it's a fun time. Um, any other questions about this? Uh, yeah, what exactly did you mean by local screening as opposed to bar screening? What's the idea there? I think you used the word local when you said that uh, the Milky Way is likely to screen um, uh, the LMC, which I think uh, that certainly might take on it. So the question is, what do you do to get around that? Is there a theory behind it, or is it? So in, uh, if you look at f of r gravity, yeah. just as formulated, then regardless of the f of r function, you more or less know how to combine local and environmental effects at a certain location. But you could imagine models in which the environment is more important or the local potential is more important. Namely, the local group may be more important for determining screening versus the Milky Way. Jeremy has looked at a paper that Justin Curry and Lasha Berezinski wrote in which the screening is not set non-locally at all. It's determined by the local dark matter density. Right. I mean, that's an interesting point because you could get huge fluctuations. Yes. But uh, not easy to make a model. Yes, he has one. You can look at it. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of related to it. I have a question about that. There was a clip from Virginia Vesla in September about sort of some like, updates in terms of thinking about the local dark matter distribution let's say all these uh, guy and other survey observations in terms of the um, uh, effective each of the gravity distribution uh, with the LMC and the Milky Way, and that the LMC is you know, more massive, which is claiming that people have previously thought. So for this, sort of all this screening stuff, has those observations and models been explored as well? You know, we are operating over like two orders of magnitude between supernovae and Cepheids uh, and uh, the Milky Way and main sequence. 
So 10, 20% changes don't affect us a whole deal, but if we are to carry this forward, uh, that work is certainly relevant. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at the implications. OK. Um, I want to talk about galaxy clusters for 10, 15 minutes. Moving on to new subject, um, so I was wondering about uh, recently there was a claim that 10% of type 1A supernovae uh, probably have a different mechanism than the rest because they see uh, these um, uh, bimodal distribution in the spectrum, the two velocity components. So I'm wondering what's the, uh, what, what, what's the implication for the propagation of big plot? I don't have anything useful to say. I know there's studies uh, like this and uh, another study that I don't believe is published yet that looks at the fact that uh, there seems to be an offset in the Phillips relation with respect to galaxy type and that the calibration sample has more late types. So that, yeah, these are all uh, fair things to explore that I don't have much expertise to add on here. Yeah. I'm just taking the puzzle as given, uh, the tension as real. Maybe it'll go away. Uh, OK, galaxy clusters. This, this is an n-body simulation of a galaxy cluster. Biggest objects in the universe, still dynamically young. Stuff is falling in. They look like a mess. But they're a beautiful mess, <laughs> most of us think. Uh, so uh, I want to show you recent progress on measuring their profiles and on this feature called splashback. So uh, this is our, uh, you know, from one year ago, DES measurements of the profile of the light, just counting galaxies around the galaxy cluster. Yeah, this is the, you know, the virial radius, one megaparsec or two megaparsecs. And so this is going up to 10 megaparsecs. And you can see the measurements are quite precise. The really fun thing is that now with lensing also, we are getting 10% error bars in each bin. And so we can do some precision studies. The, the curves, red and dashed, are our model fit. So you can see that we think we can fit the data quite well. I'll show you the model in a second. Uh, and the bit that I want to show you is that we also think we can separate the part that's uh, collapsed in the cluster versus the part that's outside, even though there's all these streams falling along filaments. So that's this topic called splashback. Let me show you this first. That, it, that if you take a model, so, sorry, let me back up actually. So these measurements used optically identified clusters. So we went to all this trouble, did these great measurements, and agonized over the methodology to establish that there's this dynamical boundary called splashback. I actually should have had a slide on it, but I don't. So let me just draw it. Can you all see this? Uh, that here's a cluster, there's stuff falling in. And because it's dynamically young, there's enough material that is just turning around. And everything that fell in before is doing smaller orbits. So these simulators pointed out that even though individual clusters look like a mess, if you stack a bunch of clusters, this boundary, which is a phase space caustic, shows up in the density profile as sorry, as a exaggerated here feature, because there is a deficit of stuff outside it. And so if you can establish it, it's very cool, because one, you have a special scale, like a non-linear analog of a BAO. And two, you have a dynamical basis to define the boundary of a cluster. Because this inside it, things are on multiple streams. Outside it, nothing has been inside the cluster. So this is what we found through a careful analysis of these profiles, where we showed that you can robustly associate this part with the multi-stream part of the cluster. And it's much steeper than NFW. So that's called splashback, the splashback radius. It's a bit bigger than the virial radius. And uh, people are working on doing cosmology with it. It seems to give a better mass function and so on. I'm interested in more small scale things. So the first thing we found is that it disagrees with lambda at CDN. Second thing we and Sir Moore and others found is that it's because the clusters are found using red galaxies, which has some selection biases. And so then having gone to all the trouble, 
to find splash back, <coughs> we then had to take a step back and work with SZ selected clusters. So if you select clusters using the SZ peaks, they are much closer to a mass selected halo catalog and the selection is completely different from the galaxy cross correlations we use to establish splashback. So there's almost no chance that the selection algorithm and the splashback measurement could, be, could have some bias of that kind. So there's still things to worry about at the percent level, but we think we can really do things at the 5% level with the sample. So this is a log derivative of this profile. It has a clear minimum. And when we fit out the one halo term, we get something that's much steeper than NFW. NFW has a log derivative of minus 2.5 or so at the virial radius. The blue curves show <clears throat> the measurements from um, and body simulations. So these are the error bars on the location of splashback. Um, and so even with a first detection like this, we are getting you know, 20, 30% error bars. So when you have a sharp feature, you can measure it uh, precisely very quickly. So, so far, we believe we found this true phase space boundary in the data in both light and mass, and they seem to track each other. Uh, and as these selected clusters agree with theory. So what can we do with it? Now I'm going to give you an update on stuff we've published, so some ongoing work just to spark discussion and interest and connect with stuff that you guys are doing. So we had a theory, uh, there are these two theory papers where we point out that you can use this to test for modified gravity or SIDM. This is again the log derivative of the profile. Um, and it's easy to see why if infall velocities are enhanced, then the splashback is going to be at a different location. If dark matter has self-interactions, there's going to be a drag force. So it actually turns out kind of subtle when you look at simulations to pick up these signatures, but um, they're in principle there. How do you get significant effect of the self-interaction splashback without messing up the center of the cluster? The center of the cluster? Yes, you. That's a fair question. You do mess up the center, um, but not enough to test easily. So here you see some variation in the profiles, because cluster centers are hotbeds of gas physics and mergers and observational issues. Like slight miscentering means that your profile around the center will will be off. In fact, if you miscenter, you'll measure a flatter profile, which could look like an SIDM core. So <clears throat> it is a debatable question where the signatures are best pursued. And I'm going to wait a few years to pursue these, having written <laughs> a theory paper, because um, it's subtle. Can I just uh, ask a question about the, uh, the, this uh, log uh, slope? Or mm -hmm. slope? Um, was there a selection in the end body or, or the uh, gas or whatever, however they did it? Was there a selection on types of clusters? From the theory side, uh, no. So, so, so when we do these that, stacks, it's just mass selected. Yeah. Uh, I would have expected what you would want to do is to try and throw away the major recent major mergers. And yes, there. those could give you a cleaner signature, but then you have to really worry about when you do the same thing in observations. You'd have to become blind. <laughs> For starters, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll show you a, a place where we do do a selection in a few minutes. So OK, if I go for six, seven more minutes. Thank you. So. Um, um, the astrophysics of galaxy quenching and gas physics is more dramatic and uh, something we are excited about. So these are galaxies outside a cluster, galaxies inside a cluster, 
If you allow a little confirmation bias, <laughs> there's more blue disks and more red ellipticals inside. So this is something that's been known since the days of Dressler and co. But we still think this is a cool plot. If you plot the fraction of red galaxies versus blue galaxies, flat, rising, almost flat, falling. So if you allow this to be completely flat, just this plot tells you that the quenching of disk galaxies is driven largely by the cluster and is not happening outside. There are definitely plausible reasons to expect it to begin before they fall in. After all, these things live in groups and interact. Uh, but it's also very cool that this is consistent with this dynamical boundary. So if you like, we could have found this flashback radius just by looking at galaxy colors. So we've taken this a little further. We've identified, we found a, frank, a, a population of galaxies that are blue enough that their log derivative is a pure power law. A pure power law with slope minus 1.5 is what you expect in Newtonian gravity if you're falling onto a point mass. So we don't think in reality these galaxies are perfect traces. After all, they do quench. They do. Their numbers aren't exactly conserved. But they are pretty close to a population of test particles falling under gravity. Just to double check, that gray bar, that splash rate radius that we found prior, and that's not independent of just looking at the Exactly. Exactly. So red galaxies look like um, the mass. So, so Shmita Adhikari has these cool phase space plots. So this is, let's just look at these two panels. This is the radial velocity, 1,000 kilometers a second, 2,000 kilometers a second. This is radius, 1 megaparsec, 5 megaparsecs. This is the infall stream. As things get closer to a cluster, their infall velocity picks up. This is things in virial motions. You get things moving towards you, away from you. If you look at things that have fallen into the cluster very recently, so this is from simulations where these are particles that have only fallen in since A of 0.85, then you see only an infall stream. So I showed you previously a pure infall population. Um, that's a little bit different. But here, she matched these quartiles in accretion time to quartiles in galaxy color. And they agree better than I would have expected them in any real world. So the dashed curves are simulations. The solid are fits to the data, hence more smooth. And you see we have two populations of galaxies that map onto subhalos. So this is not actually splashback. These are just galaxies that haven't made it to pericenter at all. So we're starting to have fun with this, like fit models of quenching with parameters like quenching time, infall time, and looking at different splits of galaxies and color and magnitude. OK. Just because I talked to Dick and Martin about SZ and Hydro. This is a movie from, uh, that Eric Baxter made. We are also looking at gas shocks and their relation to splashback. So this is, I don't know how many megaparsecs, and the SZ profile on the left. And you see all this fun stuff. So this is the gas. This is from the 300. Uh, the 300 project, I think it's called. These are hydro sims. And you can see mergers and shocks propagating. And the profile is changing wildly as this is happening. So this is a movie in which Eric tried to um, show the shocks better. So he's actually thrown out substructure. 
So he's excluded regions that had larger deviations from the mean density at that radius. And this is the shock front. And for reasons I won't get into, the physical size of this box is changing. So this yellow curve is, the, is a fixed physical size. So, but although it's like, I don't know why he's made it a big red, uh, big yellow line, it's not relevant, so you can ignore it. And just follow the cluster and look at this. This is the profile, and this is the log derivative. So there are features here that seem to correspond to these shock fronts, because when you cross a shock front, the density drops. OK, that's now repeating. Now repeating. So you can see this feature moving outward. So there's stuff that merges into the cluster, a shock propagates out, and it moves out well past the virial radius. So in individual clusters, it seemed there's a lot going on. So he did a check that can we hope to detect it in stacks. And the first optimistic answer, perhaps, is yes. So this is the location of the minimum. And he finds two minima at you know, roughly one and three times the virial radius that other simulations have also shown some evidence for. But this procedure is more motivated by what we hope to, what we are doing now with Planck and hope to do with ACT and SPT. So this is another ongoing thing where we are trying to map, relate gas shocks to dark matter splashback. That's it. I'll leave you with this slide on what the future has in store for us with redshift surveys and 21 centimeter and CMB and the stuff. I work on more imaging surveys, Euclid, LSST, and W first. This slide is designed to offend almost everybody in the community because either your project is not there or the start date is later than you'd like or the whole timeline is shorter than you'd like. So apologies for that. Thank you. Modified gravity that I was talking about? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, no. Uh, so, what, yeah, one of the natural consequences of these screening scenarios is that beyond redshift 2 to 10, everything is screened. You get complete GR because everything is, is uh, much denser. So, the early universe is not affected generally. Sorry? Uh, why? Beyond the, uh, uh, the others, uh, the uh, so, so do you agree that uh, the universe was higher density early on? Oh. And so then the question is only at what redshift that transition happens. And if you require the solar system to be screened and or the Milky Way to be screened, you get a redshift between a few to 10. Any questions? Yeah, I have a very quick question. Uh, could you imagine looking for screening around filaments and other localized structures? And that's yes. like asymmetrical, so you might get a different screening profile? Yes. Uh, the qualitative answer is an emphatic yes, especially because in Weinstein screening, the screening term has these DI, DJ derivative terms so that you really expect it to change with the symmetry of your system. So spherical systems would be screened, pancakes would be completely unscreened, and filaments would be something in between, as I recall. Uh, in practice, when Roman Scott Yamara and co looked at it in simulations, the variation was not large. Um, but it's definitely qualitative motivation to look at filaments where something comparably big would be less screened than in a spherical distribution. Okay, any other questions? All right, if not, let's thank Guvnesh again. Thank you.